for a really interesting talk tonight. I have the very great pleasure of introducing you to our speaker today, Susan Snell, archivist and records manager at the Museum of Freemasonry. And Susan will give us a talk about Minnie Windermere, who was a nurse at the Freemasons War Hospital, and give us a little insight into Minnie's interesting life. We are very excited about this, Susan. Over to you. Thanks very much, Jane. Well, let me just um, begin the slideshow here. There we are. And this is a very recent find. This is a picture of Minnie in her study at the Freemasons War Hospital. So let's find out more about her. When I catalogued the records of the Royal Masonic Hospital five years ago, I discovered another small treasure. In a box of items deposited with the museum for safekeeping, I found a small cloth bound untitled volume with a red spine. A handwritten inscription on the frontispiece describes this notebook as the Freemasons War Hospital, number one, 237 Fulham Road, matron's weekly report to the committee for 1918. On closer examination, the volume contains reports about hospital life and the medical administration of patients written by the matron, Miss M. E. Windermere. Each entry is signed by George F. Marshall on behalf of the hospital subcommittee from the 29th of May 1918 until the war hospital closed on 10th of September 1919. No earlier volumes dating from when the hospital opened in 1916 survive. Before finding this volume, no one knew much about the first matron apart from her name. The pages of this small book reveal details about her life and her significant contribution to the success of the war hospital. Several Freemasons, including Major Heaton Ellis, Percy Still, and four other members of Malmesbury Lodge, London, proposed founding a Freemasons hospital a nursing home for members in 1911. And here we can see them um, in portraits painted by the artist May Bridges Lee in 1935 with a founder's jewel for Malmesbury Lodge, London. This small but active group generated considerable membership support and two years later, Grand Lodge endorsed the proposal. Grand Lodge recommended the scheme to the favourable attention of the craft at large and fundraising started. However, the outbreak of war in 1914 led to a change of plan. Grand Lodge offered to run and meet the expenses of a hospital for the war office, as long as the government found suitable premises. Grand Lodge acquired the former Chelsea Hospital for Women at 237 Fulham Road for £10,000. The first patients entered the Freemasons War Hospital in September 1916 and King George V and Queen Mary visited soon afterwards. Two resident medical officers, Dr. Robert Maxwell Chance, an Aberdeen University graduate, and Dr. Leonard Charles Dobson worked alongside the matron. Miss Windermere supervised the Red Cross and voluntary aid detachment or VAD nurses, as well as all the domestic staff. Born at Tranmere, Cheshire in 1877, Minnie Evelyn was the second child and one of two surviving daughters of a Swedish merchant marine captain, Olaf Anders Windermere, and his second wife, Amelia, the youngest daughter of Captain Jago of Rock Ferry. Olaf's first wife, Helen Catherine Newlands, died in childbirth just two years after their marriage, but Amelia gave birth to 10 children, seven of whom survived infancy. Olof, described as a master mariner 
and a Swedish subject obtained a certificate of naturalization to become a British citizen in March 1877. And we can see at the bottom of this counterfoil, Minnie is actually mentioned on the document, even though she was just a month old. The son of a farmer from the Swedish coastal town of Karlsham, Olaf served on board several merchant vessels. He qualified as a master mariner and gained his certificate of competence from the Board of Trade in 1864. Amelia, known as Minnie, travelled with her husband on ships from Liverpool carrying goods and passengers to India, Australia and New Zealand. She gave birth to a daughter, Olive, on board the Grasmere, a son, Adolf, on board the Thirlmere, and another daughter, Nenny Newlands, on board the Usemere, launched by Potter and Sons of Liverpool in 1884. All three ships formed part of the Mir line of the Liverpool and London Shipping Company, Messrs Fish, Fisher, Sprott and Co. One newspaper report noted that passengers were thoroughly well pleased with the efforts made for the comfort by Captain Windermere. It mentions that poor Amelia experienced the death of an infant son during a rough voyage in the Bay of Biscay. Having survived one disaster when the Usemere, a four-masted iron sailing ship, went aground near Calcutta in 1890, Captain Windermere was swept overboard and drowned off Cape St Francis, South Africa in July 1894. By 1891, the expanding family had settled at Hollybank a comfortable residence in Hastings Road, Pembury, Kent. However, the unexpected death of Olaf three years later changed the grieving family's financial situation. Olaf was a Freemason initiated in Pembroke Lodge, West Derby, Liverpool in 1872, while a captain of a bark, Alice. He was not, as far as our records show, passed or raised in a lodge meeting under the English Constitution, and he was admitted omitted from annual returns after 1876. Despite leaving his family, the present day equivalent of about £193,000, his widow Amelia found a paid position to support the numerous Windermere offspring. She accepted a post as matron in charge at the Skinner's Foundation School, St John's Road, Tunbridge Wells. This role provided free accommodation for her and the younger children, while the older children found jobs elsewhere. Two sons educated at the school, Andrew Lyon and Dun Leonard Duncan Windermer, emigrated to Canada as farmers under the Foundation Settlement Scheme. Both resettled in England after serving with the army during the First World War. After attending Tunbridge Wells Girls High School, Minnie studied for six years at the Horticultural College at Swanley, Kent, where she received a prize for the best flower spray and lectured on beekeeping by 1898. The lecture room was a former Bessemer Paddle steamer saloon, sadly lost when the house at Swanley was bombed during World War II. The college, which opened in 1887, soon provided training for female students. By coincidence, Swanley's War Garden Training Scheme received donations in 1916 from the Queen's Fund from money given by the wives and daughters of Freemasons. The fund was set up to help women experiencing financial hardship due to the war find employment. The year after her father's death in 1894, Minnie changed her career plans and was among the first trainees to study physiotherapy and gain a certificate from the Society of Trained Masseurs. 
established by a small group of nurses, this organization, now the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy, aimed to restore the reputation of medical massage after several scandals. After this introduction to medical care, in 1900, Minnie started three years training as a nurse at Guy's Hospital, London. She provided a role model for her younger sister, Nellie Newlands Windermer, who also trained as a nurse at Guy's from 1908 to 1911. Aged 26, Minnie gained her nursing certificate qualification in August 1903. According to Guy's hospital records at London Metropolitan Archives, the matron who supervised her train training summarised her, her work as neat and thorough and methodical, abrupt manner but kind to patients, conduct and punctuality good. The next year, Minnie qualified as a midwife and received a certificate from the London Obstetrical Society. Minnie gained experience in various medical disciplines at Guy's, but specialised in renal nursing. Oops. On her appointment as matron of the War Hospital, the Freemason magazine noted she was known as Sister Bright after a ward at Guy's Hospital. This ward was named after Richard Bright, the father of modern nephrology, which is the study of kidneys, who gave his name to Bright's disease after working at Guy's Hospital in the first half of the 19th century. While Minnie was training, the head nurse on Bright Ward described her as a capable nurse, very keen about her work, polite, punctual, and capable of being in charge. Minnie returned to Guy's after qualifying as a midwife, accepting a position as sister of the preliminary training school from April 1904. By the 1911 census, she was a London County Council nurse, boarding with Emma Beatrice Brett, a health inspector, at a flat in Maida Vale. By the outbreak of war, Minnie was working as a night sister on a 27-bed war hospital at Fishmongers Hall. Opened in October 1914 as the Royal Red Cross Hospital for Officers, a matron supervised eight sisters from a religious nurse training institution, St John's House. The Anglican sisters worked alongside Red Cross and VAD nurses from St Thomas's Hospital. Minnie applied for the post of matron at the Freemasons War Hospital when it was advertised in 1916. Her success in gaining this prestigious position at a 72-bed hospital represented a significant career jump. From the date of her appointment, Minnie involved the wives and daughters of Freemasons in fundraising. The matron recognised the contribution they made towards hospital running costs and by working as VAD nurses and volunteers. The hospital was funded entirely by Freemasons and only received payments for the Red Cross and voluntary aid detachment nurses. Many also encouraged the wives of leading Freemasons to get involved including the spouses of Lord Letchworth, the Grand Secretary, Alfred F. Robbins, the President of the Board of General Purposes, and James Stevens, President of the Board of Benevolence. These women helped Minnie entertain visiting VIPs, including the exiled Queen Amelie of Portugal, who called to inspect the hospital in November 1916. Minnie wrote to Ellen Robbins asking for help do come and help me to receive her and give her tea. There will be all the house committee and people buzzing about who will all want feeding and talking to. Entries in the weekly diary to the subcommittee reveal Minnie's full participation in the management and administration of the hospital. She provided reports on numbers of patients admitted Details of badges awarded to nurses for long service, staff recruitment, 
ward cleaning and donations. Finding competent nursing and domestic staff willing to volunteer or work for the wages on offers, offer proved difficult. Badges rewarded nurses working over six months at the hospital, the Freemasons War Hospital No. 2 at Philham Palace and the Cliff House Convalescent Facility at Caversham near Reading and one of the founding lodge certificates for the Freemason Hospital and Nursing Home in 1920 uh, includes images of the hospital at Fulham Palace, um, the Freemasons War Hospital on the Fulham Road and the Caversham Convalescent Home. Minnie's reports mention staff lured away by lucrative salaries offered elsewhere. Trained and experienced nurses, cooks and cleaners were in short supply and for the first time women gained bargaining powers to negotiate salaries. This skill shortage grew worse after the Peace Day celebrations in July 1919 as demobilised men expected wives and daughters to stay at home although patients remained at the hospital. Minnie was delighted to employ Miss Saunders a former Freemasons girls school pupil as a cook in September 1918. The daughter of a surgeon, Bertha Saunders, remained at the school at Clapham Junction, which later moved to Rickmansworth after her education finished. Before joining the hospital, Bertha worked as the school matron's second assistant, then took a diploma at the National School of Cookery from 1915 to 1916 and she's here supervising nurses and VADs in the kitchen. The notebook and hospital minute book mention the expensive costs of providing radiant heat and electrical treatment, successful innovations in restoring movement to paralyzed limbs. An authoress, Beatrice Heron Maxwell, wrote an illustrated publicity booklet to encourage donations. Born in 1859, Beatrice published sci-fi and detective stories to support her two daughters after the death of two husbands. The booklet, which provided much needed income during wartime, includes images of treatments at the hospital. Minnie mentions outings arranged for patients by Freemasons, in particular towards the end of the war. Mrs Guthrie Sterling contacted Minnie to organise a tea for 20 men at Cicero's restaurant, a YMCA tea room for soldiers. On another occasion, a river trip was arranged by High Cross Lodge London for 25 patients at Fulham Road and 25 men at the Freemasons War Hospital No. 2 at Fulham Palace. Edward Terry Lodge London and Zetland Lodge of Instruction also invited patients on outings for afternoon tea and river trips. Minnie tried to occupy recuperating patients by seeking the loan of a piano, a gramophone and record with records and a violin. Celebrations for Christmas 1918 were well planned, with Minnie ordering crackers in October and welcoming donations from lodges to Matron's Xmas Fund. Members of Royal Naval Lodge provided coloured papers for soldiers to make decorations. Bertha Saunders, the hospital cook, described the celebrations in Masonica, the Freemasons Girls School magazine. She described Italian and Japanese themed decorations in wards and on landings, turkeys produced at the last minute and a visit from Father Christmas. As if by magic, stockings appeared for all patients and Dr Chance wrote a review entertainment with recovering patients. This joked about wartime scarcities, mentioning novelty sausages for the wounded indistinguishable from hand grenades and describing kippers as two-eyed steaks, a novel and favourite breakfast dish. In May 1919, Minnie encouraged disabled and wounded soldiers to make items 
including bead and raffia work, sold at a bazaar in aid of the nation's tribute fund for nurses at Devonshire House Piccadilly. In recognition of her world service, Minnie attended Buckingham Palace in August 1918 to receive a Royal Red Cross Medal Second Class. That same year, Minnie joined the College of Nursing, later the Royal College of Nursing. Her sister, Nellie Newlands Windermer, who also trained at Guy's, served as superintendent at St Mark's Auxilu Auxiliary Hospital, Tunbridge Wells during the war, and received a Royal Red Cross Medal second class from King George V at Buckingham Palace in May 1918. While undertaking a demanding war role and supporting the home front at the hospital, Minnie experienced troubles in her personal life. Her mother, Amelia, was unwell, and three of her brothers served in the armed forces overseas. In January 1919, she asked for leave to visit her mother, suffering from a brain and spinal cord disease in Kent. She also requested time off in February to see a brother home on leave. Possibly due to her mother's worsening health, Minnie did not apply for the matron's post at the Freemasons Hospital and Nursing Home, which opened finally after the war hospital closed in September 1919. Instead, she opened a private nursing home in Courtfield Gardens, South Kensington. However, this post-war enterprise did not last long. As Minnie died prematurely, aged 46, on the 19th of November, 1923. Probate of Minnie's will was granted to her brother, Olaf Sidney Windermer, a surveyor and property manager. Olaf was the first of three Windermer brothers initiated as Freemasons after the war. Andrew Lyon Windermer was initiated in a Tunbridge Wells Lodge in 1929, and a third brother, Leonard Duncan, a dentist joined a lodge and chapter at Wellington, Shropshire. After her appointment in 1916, the notebook reveals how Miss Windermere negotiated successfully between medical and domestic staff, Freemasons on the hospital's committee, wives and daughters of members supporting the hospital, and the Red Cross. Like many contemporaries, Minnie rose to the challenge of working on the home front, which heralded a social revolution after World War I. She supervised the care of over 4,000 wounded patients treated at the hospital during the First World War. Described by the British Red Cross as one of the best war facilities in London, without doubt, the Freemasons Hospital owed its success to the meticulous planning and organisation skills of Miss Minnie Evelyn Windermer, a matron of distinction. <laughs> Thank you so much, Susan. Just giving people a bit of time yeah. just to read when the next webinar will be. And Great then making my job easy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic talk, Susan. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jane. That's Thank really you. Interesting. If you have a question for Susan, please post it in the chat. We will give you a bit of time to type. Susan, may I kick off the questions? It was really fantastic. Certainly, Jane. Yes. Um, I was wondering, can you explain a bit about the the voluntary aid detachment nurses or the VAD nurses uh, and Red Cross nurses that worked at the war hospital, how did you find out about them? Well, for a long time, we just had the pictures that feature them both at the Fulham Road Hospital and also the hospital at Fulham Palace. But um, the British Red Cross Museum and Archives have been hard at work and on their website, you can actually search to find the names of um, VAD and uh, Red Cross nurses who worked at the hospital. So that's, that's wonderful. It's the first time that we've known who these women were. All right. And, and, and speaking of the hospital, Susan, did, did the Freemasons War Hospital only 
treat Freemasons or only officers? Or do we know if there were ever any um, overseas patients? It's a bit of both because um, they treated all soldiers. They didn't um, discriminate between those who were Freemasons or the sons of Freemasons. And also there are a lot of patients who originally came from Canada and overseas in, from parts of the empire. In fact, they organized um, groups of lodges and members in lodges to actually go and visit uh, patients who had no family nearby um, so they could receive um, a visitor um, in London, which I think is rather nice. Very lovely. Um, let's talk a bit about um, um, mini, Susan. Um, mm. This was obviously a time when women started to get some very strong work positions and mini clearly had a lot of organizational skills in, in everything from fundraising, salary negotiation, you mentioned. Uh, was it unique for a woman at the time to be able to execute these skills as part of her job? Um, actually, it's at the end of the 19th century when women do join the workforce in more numbers uh, for the first time. By 1900, there were over 200 female doctors in England and Wales and Scotland and don't forget Ireland. Um, but other jobs were becoming associated with women for the first time. These included jobs like uh, being a secretary. Um, we've heard about the domestic work uh, in, at the hospital, but also something I didn't know before researching this paper is that factory inspectors, the very early factory in inspectors were women. So that's another interesting uh, aside. Right. Um... What would Minnie's role be described as today? That's a question for you in the chat, Susan. It sounds as if she was the CEO or general manager, really, of the hospital. I think that's right. I think we would describe her as being the general manager of the hospital. So she had reached, um, she uh, rose in position from being uh, in charge of a 27-bed hospital at the Fishmongers Hall war hospital for officers um, to being in charge of the freemasons war hospital with 72 beds so it's a significant jump in responsibility but we know from comments made by those that trained her that she was considered to be very capable of being in charge yes very much so um, Susan, this was also a time when some new forms of, of treatment started and you mentioned uh, physiotherapy courses and massages and things like that and I'm guessing that must have been a very new thing at the time. It was fairly new. Um, medical massage had obviously begun in the 19th century and this was done by women but there was a lot of controversy round about uh, 1894, 1893. And there are papers in the British Medical Journal that cover that. Um, but at the hospital, they actually had a male masseuse because men also trained in oh. massage. Because Minnie had to intervene when one patient refused to be treated by the male masseurs. We don't know why, but um, oh. <laughs> obviously <laughs> there was something <laughs> that the, the patient was a little bit concerned about, yes. But um, <laughs> you could get male and female masseurs um, physiotherapists at that time. I see. Uh, do we know when uh, the hospital closed and what the building might be used for now? Um, actually, the frontispiece has changed dramatically, but it is still a medical institution because it was purchased after the hospital. The hospital, um, sorry, I'll explain. The Freemasons War Hospital closed in September 1919, and then it became the Freemasons Hospital and Nursing Home. 
and it remained there until the 1930s when the Royal Masonic Hospital opened in purpose-built premises at Ravenscourt Park. And for some time, the premises were used as a nurse's home for nurses who worked at Ravenscourt Park. But the facade was changed and the whole building added to other premises and was for many years a, a leading cancer research establishment and is still there, I believe, on the Fulham Road. So the, the, the Freemason War Hos Freemasons War Hospital influenced the planning and the realisation of the Royal Masonic Hospital? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, as soon as it reopened after the First World War in 1920, the hospital committee realised that the premises were too small for the numbers of members that wanted treatment. And so there was a huge waiting list. So the next stage that the committee set to was to raise the funds, and it was a lot of money needed to build the purpose-built premises at Ravers Court Park. So as soon as the First World War ends and they kick off um, the Freemasons Hospital and Nursing Home, they realise that they haven't really got the space that they need. Right. Were any other buildings used by Freemasons uh, requisitions for use as part of war efforts during both World War One and Two? We don't know. Um, Freemasons Hall wasn't, but it's possible that you know there are connections to. Um, it was used as uh, Freemasons Hall in London was used as an air raid shelter during World War Two. We know that. But I have heard uh, very recently that the premises such as the Masonic Hall at, in the High Street in Oxford was used as a hospital, requisitioned for use as a hospital during World War I and World War II. And incidentally, um, when the hospital moved to Ravenscourt Park, it also treated um, lots of soldiers, sailors and airmen during World War II who weren't just Freemasons, mm -hmm. including some quite well-known people um, such as Richard Hillary, who's been lionised by Sebastian Fawkes in the Fatal Englishman uh, book, um, who was shot down, had terrible burns from a Spitfire crash and later went to um, be one of the guinea pigs at the special hospital in Kent and under uh, uh, Murdo, I think, specialist plastic surgeon. Uh -huh. Quite interesting. Yes, very. Um, Susan, a, a question for you in the chat here. Uh, does the GMC or nursing authority seek to establish where the doctors and nurses are members of Freemasonry? Um, for a long time at the Freemason, uh, sorry, at the Royal Masonic Hospital, the medical committee comprised groups of specialists who were in the main Freemasons. But very often the registrars, who often were doctors who came from um, Australia and New Zealand, as well as from Scotland and elsewhere, um, they weren't necessarily Freemasons. Right, okay, interesting. Um, let me just have a look at the chat again. Where can we go to find more information on the War Hospital? Can you tell us a bit about the records in the museum's collections? Well, all the records that we have that have survived um, are all catalogued with details available on the library museum, uh, on the museum's online catalogue. Mm -hmm. So those are available. We also have some mm -hmm. other records, such as subject files on the hospital. And in our museum collection, we have a number of items, including some wonderful uh, nurses' uniform. So um, oh, lovely. we do have a lot of resources. Yeah. And speaking of that, Susan, you, you showed us your last slide there. 
um, had some of the resources. Are there any particular archive resources that survived for the Freemasons War Hospital uh, that you particularly want to mention as, as part of your talk today? Well, just today, I found some amazing photographs of Winnie uh, as matron at the Imperial War Museum collections. So I was able to include that at the last minute and also the picture of Bertha in the kitchen supervising the yes. cooking at the hospital comes from the Imperial War Museum. But um, I know that they have got a really nice collection at Fulham Palace House and Gardens relating, well, they were donated to Fulham Palace by uh, a descendant of one of the nurses who was there. And these comprise scrapbooks with wonderful drawings um, of patients. They really are rather special and lovely. Um, so you have to go to Fulham Palace uh, House and Gardens to take a look at those, but they are wonderful. They had an exhibition about five years ago now about the role of the um, palace as a war hospital. And these um, wonderful notebooks that have cuttings and photographs and images things like that in them were uh, quite a central feature of the display ah I'll, I'll just jump to this question susan because it's a little bit in connection with what you just said uh, any connection with royal brompton hospital and fulham road not as far as we know um, although it's possible that at various times, specialists who worked at the Royal Brompton um, were also visiting consultants at what became the Freemasons Hospital and Nursing Home, and then at the uh, Royal Masonic Hospital. I see. Let's finish with this question, Susan. It's a good one. Are there any other famous Freemason doctors or nurses apart from Minnie? Well, it's funny you should mention that because um, perhaps there'll be occasion on another time to mention uh, the matron of the hospital, Royal Masonic Hospital, during the Second World War. Um, she's quite a character too, Rose Dugdale. Um, her sister married uh, as a second wife um, the author Thomas Hardy and Rose was responsible for nursing um, Hardy in his last illness down in Devon. Aha, that could be uh, an interesting Hampshire, talk. sorry, Hampshire. Yeah, 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 that could be a really interesting talk. Yes. <laughs> Another yeah. woman. We don't have much time left, I'm afraid. I want to say thank you so much to Susan for a brilliant talk. Thank you to Louise for technical support. And of course, thank you to all of you for joining us tonight and for your questions. I hope we may have the pleasure of your company again because we will be back on Monday the 27th of July at 7.30 p.m. British time with Martin, our librarian at the Museum of Freemasonry, for a talk about some very interesting and great Yorkshire treasures. To find out more, do join us on the 27th of July. It is just in time for Yorkshire Day on the 1st of August. The link to register will be available online very soon. If you haven't done so already, you can also sign up for our newsletter. Please visit the Museum of Freemasonry's website where you can find much more information about our exciting work. For now, thank you so much and have a nice evening.